Hello and welcome to our latest edition of Reef Chat where we're exploring the wonders of our amazing Great Barrier Reef and everything we're doing to save this icon and the marine life that calls it home. And this episode is particularly timely for a number of reasons. The first is um, it gives an opportunity for the millions of people who've witnessed this remarkable drone footage that's got of 64,000 green sea turtles waiting to nest on Rain Island. It's giving them a chance to hear the story and understand what's going on with these amazing turtles, the plot, the challenges, but also the solutions. And the second thing is we're celebrating the world premiere of ABC TV's Australia's Ocean which takes a stunning journey along the East Australian current from the Great Barrier Reef down to Antarctica. And we've got one of their starring celebrities from this series joining us. So this series is highlighting some of the threats that we're facing um, for very important animals that call the reef home, such as turtles, but we're also taking a deep dive in the threats that they face. We love turtles and we know that, you know, I think we had a, we had a reef chat a few weeks ago about turtles and we, we put out the bold statement that the turtle almost rivals the koala in the hearts and minds of Australians. And we talked about what an amazing project that's taking place to recover and revegetate and I guess re transform the, um, the rain island, which is the, one of the largest sea turtle nesting areas. But today we're gonna go a bit deeper. We're going to go into the threats and the solutions and the challenges to hear the story of these turtles. But more importantly, what we're going to meet is some of the remarkable people who I would say have given their lives, certainly their hearts and their minds over to these remarkable creatures. Um, the Great Barrier Reef Foundation is fortunate to have over 20 projects in action right now along the reef all reef protection projects. And in that we get the privilege of meeting absolutely the world's best reef champions and just really good Australians. So I'm really thrilled to introduce you to my new most favourite Australians, our panellists, Dr Ian Bell, who's from the Queensland National Parks Threatened Species Unit mm -hmm. and a little expert and the star of Australia, ABC's Australian Ocean Odyssey series, where he very um, deftly does a turtle rodeo and you should go okay. to the screen. And our other guest is Ian Anderson, who's a passionate turtle guardian, which is my favourite title in the world, with Team Turtle Central Queensland, who travels the lengths of, of the state to look after our reef turtles. Welcome, Ian and Ian, and thank you for joining us. Thanks, Eric. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Anna. So we're going to start getting some questions thrown in from the joys of Facebook, but as I'm, I'm going to throw to the first one, because you touched on it, um, Ian Bell, in the, the television show, and it's one that we get asked a lot about the feminization of turtles. Um, you know, what's going on with this and, and why are we suddenly having too many female turtles? And look, as a woman, I think that's brilliant. Go girl power. But there is a challenge with us only be able to breed female turtles. So take it away in and explain that for us, please. You know, turtles have been around for 120 million years and they've evolved a strategy for being able to get a mixture of males and females out off the beach. Um, after they've laid their eggs. And that strategy relies on the sand temperature, the incubation temperature during that two months after they've, they've popped their eggs out. And they have what's called a pivotal temperature. So if, they, if the eggs are incubating at a temperature below a pivotal temperature, which in the northern part of the GBR is about 29 degrees, you're gonna get males. And I remember that because you know, they're called breeds. Um, and if it's above that 29 degrees, you're gonna get females. So, um, what we're seeing is the incubation temperature slowly increasing and therefore it's, it's, it's resulting in a, a, a pretty much a night. But what we're seeing now in those sort of dinner plate size little turtles that are coming in from the open ocean, uh, we're seeing about 99%, um, sorry, about 60% um, of, of female turtles. So, so yeah, you know, we still do need some, some boys um, out there, but uh, at the moment, yeah, we're, we're basically just producing what we are thinking about is can other boys from other stocks come in and fill the gap that's you know being left by some of the, those northern um, great barrier reef boys that that aren't being produced. So there's, there's a few sort of dynamics in there too that we're trying to get ahead of them. But what might happen? But just the, so the magic temperature is 29 degrees. Is that right? Is that if the sand goes above that? that that's right. Yeah. Above that, it makes a female. They stay female essentially. And if it goes under that. 
right, well, it's, it's what's called a, a temperature dependent sex determination temperature. So, and that's at 29 degrees. So below that's going to be boys and above that's going to be females. So, but again, that, that pivotal temperature is determined about mid trimester of incubation. So they're, they're sitting, in, so, yeah, so for those sort of 20 days, if, the, if there's a 60 day incubation period, it's sometime in that, that middle 20 days, if the temperature during incubation is above or below that determines whether you're going to get boys or, or girls. Well, while we've got you, what what are the three you know the three top threats that are facing our turtles clearly you know the the, the warming waters the warming sand is having this impact but what are other you know key threats to our turtles well you know again turtles have been suffering. it's a bit like a i sort of liken it to a, a mixed martial arts fighter in the ring you know they've been <laughs> okay, you know, yeah. turtles have been beaten up over the last you know couple of hundred years but now we've got this sort of pendulum this wrecking ball of, of climate change impacts that are coming in. And, you know, we've seen temperature rises, we've seen sea level rises, we've seen sea level, you know, falls, we've seen, um, you know, we've seen a whole, whole lots of things, but typically the population has been robust to be able to cope with those impacts. Now we're looking at, at a population that is compromised. Um, so whether they're going to be able to handle it or not, but sort of, a, and, Again, defining what the big three are now is, is difficult, but um, you know, certainly climate change with, with the feminization and nest inundation, sea level rise uh, yeah. is a big one. Um, and again, in different parts of the reef, we're seeing different impacts. So along the coastal areas where, where Ian is, you know, lighting uh, along the beaches, um, yeah. you know, boat strike and those sorts of things. But in some of the more remote areas, it's, it's water quality and it's, and it's plastic. You know, it, ingestion or entanglement in plastics and, and those sorts of things. So, you know, the big three I would put down now, and again, it's, I, I'm generalising, but um, um, for a higher predation of nests, and we're seeing 100% of nests being predated on, on Cape York at the moment. There's been, wow. some, there's been some fantastic work done on, on that, but... Um, it's, and is that uh, pigs, Ian? Is, are pigs the... the, the yes. Yeah. 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 It's fe feral yeah. pigs, not like, you know, babe, really ugly. <laughs> yeah, feral and, bad pigs, yeah. yeah. And there's been a lot of money being spent on reducing pigs, and, they've had a tr and the communities up there that have been involved in it have, have done a fantastic job. And, you know, they, they concentrate on it, they can knock the population down, and they can, they can get, you know, 80 90% hatchling production. But then pigs are capable of 2.2 offspring a year. So if you don't do it every year, it's like weeds. You know, if you don't control them, they just blossom back again. And um, and 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 now I was talking with one of the people doing the work up there, and they're seeing 100% predation in this. So, yeah, and then along the east coast, we're seeing pigs as well in the north, foxes and dogs in the south. Um, so that, that that's a big impact. Um, yeah. Also, entanglement and ingestion and interaction with fisheries. You know the the, the, the discarded ghost nets that are that are rushing down from Southeast Asia, um, um, you know, huge impact in the Gulf and and a little bit on, on the East Coast as well. But inshore gillnet fisheries, some of those sorts of things, some fantastic work has been done uh, to try and to try and um, address that. But it's still a, it, it's still an impact. And, and the other thing that we're seeing and we're having reported to us by some of the elders in the communities is a level of unsustainable take by some communities that. That you know that 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 elders are really worried that that too many turtles have been taken by some of the young fellows and those sorts of things. But again, we've got things in place, we've got programs in place, we're developing agreements, we're developing educational awareness and those sorts of things to address that that sort of thing. The other thing that we've got to understand is that we share our turtle populations with our neighbouring countries, Papua New Guinea, Vanuatu, New Caledonia, um, Victoria and Joe, and those sorts of things. So well, we can protect them here once they go to be some of these neighbouring countries. Again, they're going to be facing a range of threats there as well. Well, thank you. That's a good context. And I think it, it is, it's a perfect storm of threats. There isn't one single threat. And, and I think that it's how that's playing out in this in, interwoven approach, which I think it's, it sort of really brings it into Ian Anderson, who, I mean, I want to ask you about the power of, of volunteers and what volunteers are doing to protect turtles. But before that, I want to understand, we all love a fear of turtles and, and even just the ocean because you are you're sort of an extreme volunteer. You support you know, the Royal Blue, you know, the turtles. What, what is, what, how did you get into this? Or as, as far as you can remember, even as a young boy, 
where you've always had this relationship and always wanted to be working with with the ocean what's what's your story Ian? yeah look yeah I, I haven't been in it for a long time I guess uh I, I can remember back to going to Monrepo when my my kids were just uh you know about this one, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, only young, and and we took them down there one Christmas, and they saw a turtle nesting down there, and we went along with Cole Olympus then, who I didn't know at that point in time, uh, but it wasn't exactly a love affair. I, I think I, I transferred up to uh, Weeper and worked in on the Cape for twelve years, and in that time, I saw the amount of debris on the beaches up there, and. Again, I, I didn't associate that with turtle nesting and that sort of thing until I went to a place called Borrelia Point and we drove a beach up to have a look at an old light shipwreck and there was all these craters in the beach all the way up and you're trying to avoid them. And again, I didn't realise that they're, they're turtle uh, nests, you know, that the uh, body pits that the turtles have been nesting in. And it's only since, uh, since then that I've been able to sort of bring the two together, I guess. So marine debris, uh, I started doing marine debris with Tangaroa in 2013. Uh, up on Chile Beach and saw all the debris there and then yeah the two sort of came together after that and I've been doing marine debris pretty much every year since then uh, and in the process of doing so caught up with Cole Olympus at Mapoon uh, doing turtle research on the same beach that we're actually cleaning up so yeah just brought the two together and uh, they go hand in hand so and I just love doing it love getting out there in the open yeah. uh, walking the beaches picking up the, the debris uh, interesting things at kind of times uh, you know, but you know some the turtles, yeah. And uh, last year, in fact, when I was up at Mapoon and I, I was doing before Cole got there, and I was doing a clean up uh, at Mapoon at Cullen Point and went for a walk after dinner out uh, to have a look at the beach and thought there might be a turtle come up. And in fact, there was. I uh, went back and got the whole team uh, from Tangaroa, there was about 12 of them there from all over Australia. In fact, one was from New Zealand and uh, one from Tasmania. And I said, I've got a turtle out here nesting. And I took the whole group out there and uh, shared that whole experience with them nesting there. So fantastic. I mean, that'll yeah. be a memory they'll have forever that you've just given them. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll never forget that. And neither will they. Uh, yeah, you know, that, that was the highlight of their whole trip up there, the whole week up there was, was seeing so that cool. turtle nesting, yeah. I think what's so powerful about the work that you do and the communities that, you know, and the organisations that you're doing it with is that it, it really shows the empowerment of local action. And I think sometimes, you know, to the point that we're talking about with Ian Bell about the reef, so many of its inhabitants, including turtles, are really up against it with a changing climate that's resulting in, you know, increased severity and frequency of these big, you know, events that scientists always knew were coming, but they're, they're here now. And then we get a lot of people who say, but what could I do? I'm an individual. I don't live anywhere near the reef. And surely this is a big global political issue. But, it just, you know, you are really just the embodiment of you can get out there, you can walk up and down a river, you know, a beach, just down your street. You, you can make a positive impact and that's yeah. good for you, but it's good for you. And is, does that give you hope? Because we, you know, we really do believe there's hope for the reef. Do you feel really hopeful for the reef? Yeah, look, there's so many more people now that are, you know, uh, uh, in tune with what's going on with debris and it's not just on the beaches, you know, it, it ends up there. Uh, that's that's the end place for it. But, uh, you know, and in fact, last night on last night's show, I saw it was ended up down in Tasmania. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah it's just incredible. But, uh, yeah, so many people now that, that go out, they take a bag with them and they yeah. pick up rubbish when they go. So they're, they're realising that. But it's the impact of the stuff on the streets, uh, you know, ends up in the waterways and on the beach. So, yeah, there's so much that people can do just just by not flicking that Coke can out the. I shouldn't say that, but a can oh. or a bottle, throwing it out the window. You know, yeah. it's just not on. You know, because no. it, it ends up as pollution. Yeah. No, that look, it's a great message, and I think one that everyone around the world would really applaud. So we just got a question here that someone's come in, which I think is a really great question. Which was, look, I saw this footage of thousands of green turtles. They all be fine to me. Does this mean green turtles are fine? What would you say to that, Ian Bell? <laughs> uh, it was absolutely amazing footage. I think it wasn't you know, it remarkable. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's terrific. And you know, I've, I've actually walked around Rain Island um, when there was twenty six thousand turtles up attempting to nest on nest in, in one night, and you know you couldn't walk from this part of the beach to that part of the beach without stepping on a turtle because they were 
this uh, case together. So it, it is amazing. My concern is that they, you know, they went there the year before and they flying their drones and you know, we don't see that point. And I've been there when there's been two little turtles are made up, you know, yeah, and, and those. So you've got to sort of get in, and it looks fantastic to see, but you know, populations do, do fluctuate. And, um, and, and also, as I said before, some of the work we've been doing indicates that, you know, if there's even the little turtles coming through, there's going to be no teenagers. So, you know, I, you know, are we seeing, you know, this population that looks fantastic, but there's nothing coming in behind it. But so, yes. you know, so, you know, we are looking at those sorts of things as well. And we're about to start another um, a project up there looking at the, the, what the foraging population looks like next to, basically next to Rain Island. So the, the, ter the hatchlings that are coming down that, that are populating that, that sort of water. So again, we're trying to get ahead of them, you know, what, 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 what the future looks like. And, and again, by looking at the feeding population, by looking at those sub-adult turtles, it's a bit of a like a, you know, we, we, we can see what the future is going to look like. So we're going to try and make some predictions around that as well. But at this stage, wow. yeah, it's not looking great. That's, yeah, well, I think, and I think that's one thing I've heard is you can have a, a big year for nesting, but that doesn't mean you'll have a great hatchling success because it's high density real estate. It's a, you know, it's a small island. And I must admit, I've been fortunate to be on the island twice, just, and both years they were quite bumper years. And all you're seeing is this, you know, very heavily pregnant turtle digging up someone else's clutch next to it. And it's like, no. So, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting dynamic that footage is amazing and I think for everyone who's experiencing such a, a challenging 2020 to just see nature doing its thing and yeah. the simple wonder of that it was the tonic that we all needed but I think what it also does and that's why this conversation is so powerful is we're hearing so much bad news and there is a lot of bad news of this year but just hearing you talk about it we're not just looking at footage of that and going she'll be right everything's fine we're looking what that means for forward population we're looking at how we can get more nesting areas you know more food um, sources how we can ensure that this species continue to have those sites and we almost take them for granted which is that's what success looks like i guess isn't it, it it's amazing you know it's it's uh, to, to me those sort of mass migrations is like the the wildebeest across the, the serengeti and the you know the, the monarch butterfly migrations and the, the you know it's just amazing to, to think that they can coordinate their breeding to help them you know all, all at the same time and arrive there but yeah i think and it's fantastic to see but I, I don't think it's a sign for us to take our foot off the, the accelerator with what we're doing and you know you know even though we're seeing that yes you know there's there is hope out there we've got to have hope and and yet let, let's use that as a as a you know way to go forward with it absolutely and i mean rain island is it's sort of precious real estate from a Great Barrier Reef perspective and, and you can't really get onto that island. It's not a tourist hotspot at all. It's very protected. But I guess, you know, what Ian Anderson has to deal with is turtles in, in, in the neighbourhood. Um, and there you've, it's up to humans to almost guard turtle nests. And is that something that you've had to do, Ian, sort of yeah. get out the torch and protect them? Yeah, not so much get out. Oh, we, we do go out. Well, no, no torches. Yeah, well, no, the torches are off, sorry. But uh, yeah, but uh, we are out there. And, you know, it's such a vast area. I mean, Rain Island's a hotspot, obviously, and, the, and there are other hotspots like Monroe Po, Curtis Island, for argument's sake, some of the other islands, you know, Heron Island, um, different species of turtles in those areas. But um, there's more remote areas and uh, not as not as such a hot spot like here in Panam Sands. They nest here, but I had three nests last year. You know, that's oh. so. And uh, how does yeah. that, what, what what does it involve to defend or protect a turtle nest? Yeah, look, you're looking at a number of things. You're looking at uh, protecting them from from wave inundation for a start. If they, if they happen to lay too low in the in the sand and they get flooded, which we had one right here in front of the surf pod last year, that got flooded up straight after it had nested. Um, Others, uh, you know, predation from foxes, uh, humans, you know, uh, four-wheel drive vehicles driving up on dunes and that sort of thing, you know, this behaviour we're trying to change there to, to keep them off that habitat. So many different things. So trying, trying to uh, keep, them, keep them safe and, uh, yeah, and look for, look for tracks of predators and so on. Uh, we had one of our members of our Team Turtle group uh, last year that uh, we had a flatback nest down on um, wild... Cattle Island and uh, 
Yeah, she decided it was due to hatch uh, any day. So she went down and spent the night there with a the dog on the beach and, uh, you know, uh, slept with it. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> it didn't hatch. <laughs> and I, I honestly don't know if it, it did actually uh, hatch or not, that, that, uh, that particular one. But, uh, you know, she went through that process of going down there to see. Oh. And, you know, it, it, it's hard to determine. I guess Ian Bell could uh, talk more about that, about the, the uh, incubation times. But last year, um, we found they were actually coming out at 48 days on Curtis Island. Uh, which normally up around what 55 days, I think it is somewhere about there. Wow. Uh, so yeah, trying to pick that particular day to go down there, uh, it may not. You don't mention the pregnant woman. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it was a lot to do with temperature and uh, you know the, the temperature of the sand and all that sort of thing. So yeah, and they were coming out earlier last year. So uh, uh, we had about nearly 90 odd nests, I think, on uh, Curtis Island. But we looked at the hatchlings in uh, January. And uh, yeah, they were coming out around 48, 49 days. Um, wow, so, that's interesting, isn't yeah. it? I would have to say, Ian, that that would be one of the coolest jobs to say, I protect turtle nests. Yeah. I hope yeah. you can write that on your passport application because you'll be the coolest yeah. guy going through Protector custom. of turtles, yeah, that, that's the one, yeah. yeah. No, <laughs> I love doing it too, yeah, it's great. Questions come through from Donna, and this is a good one. I've been asked this a number of times because people want to know so she's basically said look we've seen numbers of 26,000 turtles and numbers of 64,000 and certainly that's the number with the drone footage and she's saying how do you actually make these number estimates and I must admit even I <laughs> went into the process and was thinking yeah yeah well I might just count a, you know, how many in you know a square kilometer and just you know amplify it but Ian, t t give us the scoop. We actually hand count them, don't we? Yeah, that's right. And the night that we counted, you know, the nights that we were counting that sort of number on Rain Island, we actually formed a line. There were seven or eight of us all walking side by side, and we did a sweep around the island, and you counted all the turtles to your right hand side with a. With a you got clickers, yeah, yeah. That's right. And that's Otherwise, that's that would be really hard. <laughs> was that was that four or five or six or eight or yeah? So that. No, it, it's a pretty accurate count, and, and we did, did the one sweep around the island, counting, counting every turtle on the island. Yeah. And I think that's what's been really powerful with the, the use of technology, because that is how it's been. And then also in the, the good old days, um, a couple of years ago, they used to paint a turtle's um, hat back with a white mark. And now, at least with the use of drones, you can have quite high sort of vantage to have a look and count as well and really proof check and fact check those numbers, can't you? That's right. And they were painting the stripes before the drone flights and then counting the, the number of turtles that were painted and then compared to the number of turtles that weren't painted and then using statistics, mathematics, to work out what the overall population was around the island. So I think, you know, to answer your question, Donna, there, there, is, a, there is a method to it and it's, it's probably a bit more... Um, detail than people would perhaps expect and you do see fluctuations at 64,000 that's a real record um, there's been years where it's 10,000 there's years where it fluctuates and it's hard to know when you have a, a really bumper nesting year um, but there is a process to it and this is just the work of our amazing marine park rangers who are real frontline providers um, are all turtles reef and on the reef endangered Ian Bell do you want to answer that one Yes, yes they are. Um, but again, it's complex because different populations, the, like the Southern Great Barrier Reef, green turtle population, um, is, it has shown signs of recovery for the last, um, you know, for the last 40 years since, since Cole's been monitoring it. Um, but we have to understand that that's coming from basically a zero base because um, they use those southern great barrier reef green turtles in the soup factories and they used to you know take them off the nesting beach and boil them up and they go and stop that in the i think it was the 1940s so and they stopped the canneries at heron island and in Norton bay and those sort of places because they ran out of turtles so yes that population has been building which is great i mean they're still you know they're still threatened but um and then you know, some species like leatherbacks, where we haven't had a nesting for 20, over 20 years now in, in Queensland. So, you know, we've got to sort of draw a line into that, possibly. Um, the, the predation on the Ridley populations on the Western Cape, you know, real alarm bells ringing about that sort of thing. So there's this mixture, and, and some we just don't know. Flatbacks, um, there's some really good stuff that, um, you know, Ian's involved with in, in, the, in the southern GDR that's uh, getting good numbers around there. But 
the, the, the highest concentration of black bat nesting is a place called Crab Island off the tip of Cape York. So it's difficult getting there. It's, um, it's difficult getting good numbers. So we're diet efficient for that for that stock. Mm -hmm. uh, and and again, the alarm bells ringing around that that northern Great Barrier Reef green turtle stock is that you know we we still need to do a, a lot more sort of prodding around that to try and find out what that population trajectory looks like. Well, thank you for that. We've got about five minutes, and so I thought I would. Someone asked a question about what some weird behaviours you've seen in your <laughs> working with turtles and turtles. You know, they're like, you know, the closest thing we've got to dinosaurs, aren't they, really? They are quite remarkable. They do some very strange behaviour. So, Ian Anderson, what's the strangest thing you've seen a turtle? Or you've uh, heard just a turtle this, this, this last hatching season, actually, on Curtis Island, and we had a hybrid. It was a, a cross between a, a, a flatback and a loggerhead. And, uh, yeah, we were just monitoring the, the mainly flatback nests and the hatching, and uh, I had two nests sort of hatching about the same time. And I slipped over to the second one to have a look to see if they were, they'd emerged as yet. And the first one just popped its head out. And I thought, hello, <laughs> you're different. <laughs> and it turned out it, it's, it, it was a hybrid. Yeah, it wasn't a real successful nest. I think we only had 11 hatchlings come out of that particular nest. Uh, the rest were all dead in the nest, but um, unfortunate. But we managed to uh, get one of them back. And it's now being reared in the... Um, it's uh, the... Uh, uh, sea, the Sea World, I think it is, in, in uh, the Sunshine Coast. Yeah. Wow. Uh, uh, the, um, and they're going to raise it for 12 months and then release it uh, back where it came from. So, uh, yeah, it'd be how, remarkable. how that turns out because there's not a lot of data, I believe, on, on hybrids. It, it, it is common, apparently, but not a lot of data has been collected on them. So, yeah. Uh, how cool. You different. got to see it. That's yeah. very cool. Yeah. How about you, Ian Bell? What's, uh, what's some weird behaviour or something wacky you've seen? Yeah, look, I'm a total nerd, so I, I find it all pretty weird and amazing. But um, I think some of the um, I think some of the most amazing stuff they do are the migrations. Um, we we tagged a, a young teenager um, girl uh, at Prince of Charlotte Bay, and she matured. She became a, an adult and then migrated up to the Marshall Islands. So you know, you know. You know, these these animals are the size of your coffee table, and they've got the brain the size of the pea. You know, they're not. There's not a lot happening upstairs, but they, <laughs> they actually, you know, navigate. Um, you know, 30, 40, 50 years later, from um, somewhere to 7,000 kilometres away, and go back and 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 you know, lay their eggs on the beach that they are beach close to where they hatched as 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 you know little babies. You know, 30 or so years ago. So, absolutely amazing behavior so yeah that was that was pretty amazing i thought that's that's pretty yeah. neat. and final question for the session someone's asked what can i do to help turtles so both of you what is one thing that you would say to somebody that they can do in their daily life or just in their behaviors that and that will make a difference for turtles get yeah. involved get involved i would say uh, you know get in touch with mon repo the uh, in fact the invitations came out yesterday for people that want to get involved in the training at Monrepo, um, yeah, email them and, and notify them if you're interested and get involved in, in listening to Cole Olympus for a start, just uh, share his knowledge uh, down there and then getting out on the beach with like-minded people and uh, getting involved in the monitoring air. Yeah. Beautiful, that's great advice. Ian Bell? Yeah, it is difficult and I, I, I agree with what you said earlier. I mean, people seem to be overwhelmed, you know, we've lost, you know, 90% of fisheries and seabird populations have declined and little fairy things were lost in the massive fires. We've had, we just seem to get bombarded with this sort of bad news. So, you know, what can I do as an individual? But I think, and, and I, get, I get that it's difficult, but I think it's not what, you know, what anything can we do. I think we've got to do everything now. Um, and, and I think supporting NGOs um, to do the work that are doing it full time. It's difficult to do as an individual, but support the Great Barrier Reef Foundation that are, that, are, that, are, that are doing those things. Support the, you know, the Australian Maritime, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the conservation NGOs. So that's that side. But then also, you know, we're a democracy. So local government, state government, the federal government, you know, they are going to change laws, they're going to make laws, they're going to put in place the, the drain, the strain, the drains, and those sorts of things. You know, to, to be able to make a difference. So, you know, as individuals, we can lobby governments and we can support people who, organisations like yours, that are doing this sort of stuff full time. 
And I think both, both of those things are great, great things. And look, on behalf of everybody also, I just want to salute what you guys do. I mean, you're really in the front line. And I think a lot of people forget that there are frontline workers in the environment as well. And, you know, it's so, you know, what you do makes all of us really proud to be Australians, I have to say, because it shows that we're not just watching a, the decline of, a, of an icon and an environmental ecosystem. We're actually leaning in. We're, we're bringing our A game and, and we care. Um, and, you know, we're going to do everything we can to make sure that we can bequeath all this wonder to our kids and, and their kids. And that's pretty special. And look, we can talk about turtles all day. And um, <laughs> I'm really lucky that I get to do it in my job. Um, so I really want to thank um, Dr. Ian Bell from Queensland Government's Department of Heritage and Protection and our a wonderful turtle guardian, which is how we're going to refer to you from now on. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. And from Team Turtle at Central. Put that Queen. on my CV now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, you're right. You're, you're yeah. you know, absolutely a, a turtle guardian. Um, I thank everyone for tuning in and for your coming. Uh -huh. sending us for your great questions. Keep sending us these questions. We're really aware that people see great images or they hear about things and perhaps right now they can't visit the reef for whatever reasons. 2020 is a wacky year. Um, we want to make sure that we can bring the reef to you, bring this wonder to you, but also give you the story of not just the challenges, but also the solutions and what we can all do as individuals, as countries, as communities, um, and, and as a mass. You can also visit our website, www.barrierreef.org, to find out more about our irreplaceable reef. And until next time, from all of us at the Great Barrier Reef Foundation and from Ian and Ian, um, stay safe and thanks so much for your support. And see you later. Bye. Bye. Bye.